Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening y'all? Today we have Douglas Laudmel in the lab. I had to do that a second time y'all just because, you know, we got to get it right. This is the man right here. He's an expert and I'm very curious. I want you to give me your elevator pitch because we have attorneys and there's a lot of different attorneys out there. And so I want to hear when I meet you and I shake your hand in the elevator, what do you tell me that you do for the people? Well, I'm an asset protection attorney. So what I do is I create legal structures that separate your assets from your creditors. That's it. I just protect your money. Um, you know, this area of law didn't even exist 40 years ago. Yeah. And in the last 40, it's become a, a major area of the law with lots of different tools and techniques. Um, and so, you know, it, it, if you have assets, then you're somebody that I should be talking to. Um, if, you, if you worry at all, even a little bit, that something could happen and, you, you know, you could get sued or you could have a liability or the creditors could come calling, um, you're a good candidate for asset protection, almost regardless of, of how much money you have. I mean, whatever you have is important to you. So that's, that's you know, important to me. Um, that's okay. it. Okay, excellent. So, so I want to get right into that. In, in, but before we do, I like to discover, I believe people are a good reflection of their business. And, you know, it, within the branch of being an attorney, I, we just had an attorney came in who's in, he, who, who's very, very similar background. And I think people need to understand what the difference is because there's closing attorneys, then there's asset protection. And you, you happen to be, it, would you consider yourself? Obviously, I know you are qualified. You are an attorney, but is that how you call yourself? I am a lawyer or do you just pitch the asset protection and how, how are those different? Uh, yeah, no, I'm an attorney. So, um, you know, if you're doing something like this, you, you want to use an attorney, um, one, because you want to get it right. And, yeah. and believe me, there, almost every area of law, there's a, there's a corresponding uh, provider that's not an attorney that does documents or does companies or does stuff. The difference is, is you might get the company formed or you might get, you know, a, a basic set of documents, um, but it, that's not what matters. Um, what matters is the strategy behind it, the tactics that you actually employ when you have to use it. Um, and that takes expertise. And so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, a, a, I'm a lawyer, I identify as a lawyer and I run a law firm. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing is, is, is you have an attorney client privilege when you work with an attorney. If you're, if you're working with a document preparation company or somebody who just does, you know, does the, the filing for you or whatever, um, there's no privilege. And sometimes that becomes important when you're actually dealing with the, with the using the structures that you put in place. Excellent. And, and I'm glad you, you segued right into that because that, that was one of the things I noted. And when I was uh, looking at the, some of the stuff that you've been doing again for more than 20 years and, and you're covering just to put things into perspective, you're, you're protecting over, f is it 4 billion assets uh, for, uh, under, under management for your clients right now? Is that what it is? Yeah. So it's not under management. That's more of a money manager term where you manage okay. $4 billion, yeah. but I protect f over $4 billion, meaning the clients that I've done work for Mm -hmm. have together over $4 billion inside of the structures that I've created. Okay. Uh, and so, so, yeah, there's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of uh, normal millionaire next door people, um, but you add them all together, it adds up pretty quickly. Excellent. So I'm glad you cleared that up because I think when we step in the lab, we have a lot of folks here who are real estate investors and we talk about having a team. And, you know, you talk about having your lender, you talk about having your, uh, your, your property, property managers, uh, or even your general partner who you have asset managers as well. And I'm glad you cleared that up because, you know, one thing we don't always talk about is the protection of the asset in itself. And what I want to talk to you about, and maybe you can shed some light on this, you mentioned a keyword, you mentioned attorney client privilege. And, and I want to make sure we understand what that means, because I don't think everybody understands what that means and, and how important it is to have. So can you define that to us at a sure. level, you know, seven years old, I'm trying to understand what you're telling us here, just a very, in this very simple way. So we understand what it is that you can do for us. Um, well, yeah, the, the attorney client privilege in, in, it means that when you speak to your attorney, um, it's privilege. Uh, your communications with your attorney, the things that you, the, your work product that your attorney creates for you, um, it can't be subpoenaed. It can't be, court can't ask for it. 
Um, nobody can ask for it because it's under a privilege. You're allowed to speak with your attorney frankly and expect that whatever you tell your attorney is private. And so um, that's pretty important. It's actually the strongest privilege out there. It's stronger than the doctor-patient privilege. It's stronger than the priest, uh, you know, parishioner privilege. The attorney client privilege is, is considered the strongest privilege there is because people consider it, the court, the, the legal system considers it critical to be able to be honest with your attorney. Um, and that, that way we can give you honest advice back. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to protecting assets, it's, it's, it's critical. I understand what it is that you are, what assets you have, what you're concerned with, what kind of risks that you're running. Um, are there any existing creditors? Because all those things matter and they change the way that we do what we do, um, depending on how you answer all that. So, you know, it's, it's important. And, and I, you know, I, I don't fill my own cavities. You know, I brush my own teeth, but I don't, I don't, I don't you know, <laughs> fill the cavities and don't do the root canals and I don't do the crowns. I let somebody who's got the expertise and the tools do that for me. Well, I mean, you kind of walked into this one. You, who, who is, is the one who's protecting your asset? Is it yourself or is it your Well, team? yeah, I, I can protect my own assets <laughs> yeah. because, because um, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm qualified and I don't, I, I don't need a mirror to do it. I don't think a dentist can drill his own teeth. You know, that, that's different. <laughs> okay. Um, that's excellent. But yeah, I can do my own. <laughs> that's, that's pretty awesome. So, so for, if I'm an investor and I'm out there and I'm listening and I don't have someone like you on my team, how, first of all, maybe I'm, I should have gotten someone like you on my team yesterday, but how, in, at what point is it important for you to get involved? Do you get involved for existing portfolios? What is your typical client? Are they coming in with a deal that they're about to put on the contract? Let me, let's preface this a little bit. Who are you really helping? I know you can help anybody, but in this space, you're, you're, you're involved with a lot of real estate investors. At what point do you start getting involved? Well, okay. So it, it, it's not, I'm not doing the deals, right? You're going to do a deal. You have Absolutely. A, somebody who's putting the deal together. I'm working with the individual. So, if you have any assets at all, if you have no assets right now, none, none whatsoever, you're, you're just educating, you're listening to your podcast so that you, you're ready when you have your first um, amount of money that you can invest, that you probably don't need me because you, if, you don't, if they don't have anything to protect, um, you can't lose anything. So if somebody sues you and you don't have any assets, you just got a bunch of student debt, you, you don't need asset protection. If on the other hand, you do have assets, even though you may still have debt. So let's say you own your home, you have some debt, but you also have some equity. Let's say you're in two or three deals um, and you know, they're just in your own name, uh, but you've, you've, you've put some money away or you have some savings or you've, you've purchased a couple of uh, pieces of rental property yourself. Once you start having assets, that's when you should talk to someone like me um, because you want to get a plan. Now, you don't have to have $10 million worth of assets to talk to me. Um, I think the minute you have a couple hundred thousand in assets, that's a good time to start talking. Um, and, and then you get an idea of where you are going to go, where you, you can go um, in the future. And, and um, anything over that and certainly upwards of a million dollars in assets, you should be absolutely um, considering asset protection and putting something in place. Excellent. So how often would you and I, Douglas, talk to one another if you're uh, currently protecting my assets? Is it around tax season? Is it beginning of the deal? Is it when we form that relationship? You're just a call away. What's that relationship look like for, for investors on a, on a day to day? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my clients, the way I work is that I, I um, charge an annual fee to my clients and then I don't bill by the hour. And what that does is it puts us on the same side of the page. And I want my clients calling me all the time. I want them calling me anytime they have a question, um, emailing me. Uh, and, and so I talk to my clients a lot. Um, we formally sit down and do an annual review once a year, usually on the telephone because most of my clients are not local. Um, and that involves just going over all the assets, going over all the changes in, in, in what you're doing, your plans, et cetera. Um, we do minutes and, and we you know, send them to you for your file. Um, but I honestly talk to clients more than that usually. Um, usually they're calling me or they're emailing me questions. Um, once, they, once they get to understand how I work, um, they find that I'm very responsive and, and it's easy to email me with a quick question and get a quick answer versus, you know, making an appointment, coming into the office, sitting down, you know, spending two hours. Um, that's not the way I think 
yeah, people are need need much quicker response time than that. They need they need their answers when they need their answers. We're living in a society that has uh, sped up radically <laughs> since I was a kid. Absolutely, a lot faster. Instant gratification, as we <laughs> call amazing. it. I want it now, Douglas. Give me uh, the answers right now. Yeah, so uh, it, it's funny, but yeah, that that's the way I work with my clients. Okay, so. I want to take a step back because I'm going to build on that uh, because I I think there'll be a good segment for us to get into some of the, maybe the FAQs that you face. But before you get there, you had mentioned something key. You said, I'm glad you mentioned this because I think some of us listening are thinking, well, you know, I got a million, you know, uh, you know, again, assets under management. You're not a management. You, you protect the assets. So if I'm listening, I got, okay, maybe there's, you know, a million or two or a hundred K. You said when you start accumulating a couple hundred K in, I guess in, in assets, any kind um, of assets, any yeah. kind of assets, which I'm glad you said, you mentioned your own home. Uh, how granular do you get in, in, do you advise people? I know you said you, you, you own your own home in a name. Do you work with entities as well? I'm sure you do. I just want to make sure people understand, or, or can you work with Ruben Kanya? I mean, is it both and in, in what most of your business is involved? Is it mostly entities or individuals? Well, I mean, there's no entity out there that doesn't have an individual speaking for it, right? So it's individuals that I work with. So I see my clients as the individual. Any individual may have one or 10 entities. I mean, you know, we might have lots of LLCs for different things. We might have a holding company, um, trusts, et cetera. So, um, but I always see my client as the individual, as the person. So it's the person that makes the decisions. Now, if the person is the CEO of a big company, well, yeah, the company might be the focus of the conversation, mm-hmm. but I'm still talking to a person. And, um, and so, yeah, I see myself as an asset protection attorney for people that have assets. Excellent. Okay, that's good. I think that's, yeah. uh, that's very helpful for folks. So I went around, you know, I did some research. And, you know, that's what we do in the lab. I have to go in and, you know, put the magnifying glass and do some digging. And, and, and there's something interesting I've never come, come across, and I'm hoping that you can go into depth about, and that's the self-settled spendthrift trust. I have yeah. never heard such a thing. So let's take a step back because some people don't have trust. Some people have, you know, and so why don't you define to us how important it is to have a trust or define to us what a trust is for those who may not even have come across it. We've heard of them. Why is it important for someone to maybe start engaging in a trust and then tell us about your special trust that, that you, you do for your clients? Okay. So a, a trust is, is really a, um, just an agreement. So if I said to you, Hey, Ruben, um, you know, can I give you a hundred bucks to take care of? Um, and when my kid needs money, um, he comes by your house and, and tells you what he needs it for. And then you give it to him. Yeah. Um, we just created a trust, right? So I'm the settler. I created, I settled it. You're the trustee cause you agreed to take the money. Mm-hmm. And then my son is the beneficiary. And then I say, Hey Ruben, um, he likes candy. Don't give him any money for candy. It's only for lunch. I won't, I don't want you to give him candy money. And if some other kids, these bullies come around and they, and they try to get his money or you think they're going to take the money from him, don't give him that either. In fact, if you have to, go buy his lunch for him and mm-hmm. make sure he only uses it for lunch. Those provisions, those things that I ask you to do for my son to make sure that you know, he doesn't get bullied and the money taken from him, those are called spender provisions. So there are conditions under which you, the trustee, are allowed to give the beneficiary the money or use the money for the benefit of the beneficiary. So that's a trust. That's it. So (laughs) when you self settle a trust, you're settling it for your own self, for you, you as the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. So that's what a self settled trust is. Um, Usually you hear trust, they're settled for your son, your kids, your grandkids, you know, grandparents make a trust for their grandkids to go to college or whatever. But in this case, we're settling it. So Ruben is the trust settler, you're also the beneficiary. So you're saying, hey, I'm going to put this money in trust and I'm going to be my own beneficiary, but I'm still going to put spendthrift provisions around it, which in in the case of our trust, say if there's a creditor trying to reach these assets, you can't get them. Mm -hmm. And so that's what a self-settled spendthrift trust is. And that's really the definition of an asset protection trust is a self-settled spendthrift trust. Okay. Wow. Fascinating. So, I'm assuming that you, when, you know, if you and I get on a call, I 
maybe I, I have a trust, but maybe I've never had a self settled settled uh, spend spendthrift trust, as you call it. Um, how is it that you're educating me on why that's more beneficial than maybe just having a regular trust? Like, what are the benefits? If we want to just ex- yeah. you know expose okay, those so, out, yeah. So there's 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 most common trust is called a revocable living trust. Um, most people have that, and that's their estate plan. And the intent of that trust is that at your death, that trust will distribute the assets to your beneficiaries. So that's a self-settled trust. And you're your own beneficiary while you're alive. And then at death, your kids or your grandkids or whoever you say becomes the beneficiary. The, the, the challenge with the revocable living trust is that first word, revocable. Because it's revocable, it doesn't have any asset protection from creditors. So you can't put creditor provisions in a revocable living trust because a judge can always just say, well, Ruben, revoke the trust. You, don't, you have the power to revoke it. So if you can revoke something, um, the provisions don't work. So in an asset protection trust, it's irrevocable, meaning you can't revoke it. You can still be the beneficiary of that trust and then you can put the Spencer provisions in there which allow for that creditor protection. And, you know, probably the easiest way to, to, to see this is really just kind of build, uh, you know, a sample plan. So uh, let's say we have a client or, or you, you have somebody who's listening and they have $250,000 in limited partnership deals spread around, yep. right, with various people. Let's say they're also syndicating some deals themselves. Mm-hmm. So they got some carried interest um, and they're the general partner on a few deals and maybe that's worth another two or $300,000 right? Let's say they own their own home. And let's say before they started syndicating, they actually bought a few single family and a multifamily um, rental property themselves. And so they're hanging on to those still. So does that sound kind of like a typical person that might be listening to this podcast? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, good. So for someone like that, first step is to take the the assets that are um, risky, which would be the single family homes that the client, that, that the listener here owns personally yeah. and get them wrapped up in something that insulates them from risk. And for that, we use a limited liability company. Yeah. Um, I think most people have heard of that. It's an LLC. It's a common tool. Um, I'm, I'm venture to guess that a lot of people who have rental real estate and so forth have already got an LLC and are using LLCs. Same with the multifamily. That would be in an LLC. Yep. The limited partnership deals, let's say where you're just a limited partner, those you're already a limited partner. So you might be holding those directly. And then the general partnership deals, hopefully you're already using an LLC for that as well. And that yeah. you're not personally the general partner because again, using an LLC gives you some limits of liability. So all that's good so far, but it's not, it's not deep. It doesn't give you any layers of protection. Um, it, 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 it's, just, it's just a single layer. So in that structure, I would be looking to add a holding company. Mm. And a holding company would, would be something in the middle that would hold pretty much everything, right? It'll hold the limited partnership interest directly. So instead of your name being on the LP interest that you've invested in, your holding company will be on there. Nice. It'll hold the LLCs, which in turn are holding those, those single family homes and that multifamily property that you bought, right? So yep. now those yep. are all in the holding company. Um, and, you, you know, you, you probably have some cash, a little bit of investments, or maybe you're saving up for the next home. That also can go in the holding company. So that's not sitting in your personal name. Um, so the holding company pretty much has everything. The one thing it doesn't have is your primary residence because if you put your primary residence in a holding company, you lose three tax benefits of home ownership, tax-free capital gain when you sell the house, your home mortgage interest deduction, and, um, and, and your homestead exemption, which is mm. the amount of money that you can keep in your home in the event that you declare bankruptcy. We don't want to lose those three things. We, we want to hang on to those. So in order to do that, the home would go into another tool, and that tool is called the bridge trust. And yes. the bridge trust serves two purposes. It can hold the home directly, can hold a second home, and it can hold S-corp shares, which some people have, not too many anymore, but some people have S-corp shares, and those can't be held by a, a, a typical other 
company, like a holding company. Mm -hmm. And it's going to own the majority interest in your holding company. So the trust owns the holding company. The holding company has all your assets. The trust also has your home. So when we get done with that example that we just made up, um, all the assets are going to be inside either the holding company, which is owned by the trust, yep. or in the trust directly. And that structure it will, be, will be far more protective than, uh, than, than just a couple of LLCs at the bottom level, or worse, nothing at all, you know, just holding everything in your personal name. And so this is what you, you call a bridge trust. Yeah, that, 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 that trust that is at the top of everything is what yeah. I call a bridge trust. Fascinating. Now, is that trademarked? I, I saw that. Is that something? It is, that, yeah. That yeah, I trademarked created? it. And so when you, uh, if you see that anywhere, that's my trust. Um, that's I awesome. have an affiliate attorney network. So I work with uh, wow. about 100 attorneys throughout the country. And I do the asset protection for their clients. So I, um, I license or I allow those affiliate attorneys to also use the bridge trust name. So there's a lot of attorneys out there that have yeah. the bridge trust on their website, but they all work with me. Absolutely. That's, that's fascinating. And that's a, that's an epic uh, business model because we have a lot of entrepreneurs and, and, and uh, business owners in, in the, so I think that'll shine a lot of light to them because I think right. licensing is awesome. So good for you for doing that. Cause I did see the TM on them. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, Douglas. So, so that's fascinating. So bridge trust, we will remember where that came from. So yeah. I, I want to transition. That was a great uh, explanation and, and that's something I actually want to get more familiar. That's why I was like so excited to get on the show because this is all like my brain is like, pff, like I'm writing on all these notes right now. And again, obviously the point of this is to, uh, to, to inform the people on, on maybe gaps that they have. A lot of people have assets and, and they're just simply, they don't know. Maybe they just haven't come across someone like yeah, you. Or they, their attorney hasn't mentioned it. Their CPA hasn't mentioned it. I get a lot of calls every day from people who um, didn't have any asset protection and then something happens and they call me because now they start looking for it and, and they're like, God, why didn't my, my attorney tell me about this or my CPA, my financial advisor? Nobody mentioned that this even existed mm -hmm. until I had a problem and I started Googling what I can do and then they find me. Um, my advice is if, 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 if this makes any sense at all to you, if this sounds like something that um, may apply to you, have an analysis, you know, have a call with me and, and find out because even if it's, even if you're not ready for it yet, at least you know where you're heading and Absolutely. it makes a huge difference to be prepared and understand, okay, when I get here, I'm going to start my holding company. When I get here, I'm going to add the bridge trust. Um, it, it just helps you to, to, to make a plan. And, you know, if you don't have a plan, any road will do right. And you won't yeah. get anywhere you want to go. Yeah, no, and, and I'm glad you, you keep saying these key things and I want to bring them to light because you're saying it, it's all about timing, being ready. Um, and, and sometimes people say, you know, they put it on the back burner. And, and I think it's important that you mention uh, the timing. You gave a very good example of someone who primary residence, second home, limited partner, general partner is. I know you gave us a good example of when one should consider asset protection. Is it the same thing for having a holding company? Cause I know that's one key thing that, um, you know, not too many people know about, but it's very, it's an effective tool. Yeah. The holding company is part of the asset protection. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's when I do, I'm 95% of the time I'm doing both the bridge trust and a holding company. They go hand in glove together. Now, if you're not ready for the bridge trust yet, uh, and you just have, let's say, $150,000 worth of assets, and um, you're, you may be ready for the holding company. And I think it's a good idea to get the holding company started very early in your asset building career because that's where everything goes. So as you're building, you're building in the right spot. And, and, and it's an easy way to connect the, the higher level tools at a later date if you, if you start with the holding company and you get it set up in the beginning. So um, yeah, I, I mean, holding company is is pretty much everybody with any assets beyond a single LLC is ready for a holding company. Gotcha. And and because it is March, and I know to if we're listening right now, it's currently what is it, March twenty fourth, and uh, tax season is among us, even though it's been delayed for a few folks. But do you mind sharing? I don't know if this is a high level without going deep into the weeds, but is there a specific tax advantage that folks might? may benefit from or may know of from a holding company. Again, you're just putting it out there that 
um, yeah. look deeper into it, but I, I, I'm not too familiar. So is there, are there certain advantages that one may have by having a holding company? Um, from a tax perspective, there's some minor advantages. Um, most holding companies you're going to use, you're going to want to use an LLC or an mm-hmm. LP. Okay. Um, I prefer a limited partnership, an LP. Yeah. And those are pass-through entities. So they don't have their own tax rate. They have their own tax return, but you get a K-1 as a member of that and that K-1 goes to your 1040 and you pay your taxes on your 1040. Okay. But it is another place in which you can make business deductions. So if you have expenses and you know, education and seminars and classes and training, um, whatever it is, they can be deducted from that holding company from, because the, the holding company is in the business of managing your assets. Um, the other advantage of the holding company is that you can have a single member LLC owned by the holding company. Mm-hmm. What this means is that the LLC does not have to have its own tax return because it's single member, it's disregarded. And so you might have five LLCs with five different pieces of properties, but if they're all single member held by a, a, a multi-member holding company, you're just going to have the one tax return of the holding company, not six tax returns. So wow. it, it, it makes things easier if you get this started right. And a lot of people out there go, oh, well, I have to have a multi-member LLC um, that's what everybody's telling me. And so they end up with 10 multi-member LLCs and 10 tax returns and, and the, you know, it's, it's, it's costing them an arm and a leg every year with their accountant and, um, and it can be simplified if you start it right in the first place. That's, that's fascinating. Whew. That's, that's very savvy as well. Very savvy, Douglas. Um, great stuff. So I want to transition into the keeping it real segment. Um, and, and one question that I have for you is, and I'm sure as a professional, we've been doing, seeing this, it must be like clockwork to you. Like people start asking questions and you already know. So what is the biggest misconception that you think people have, you know, when they come in and they're speaking with you and maybe you're getting on an analysis call there? Um, I, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the Ooh, biggest misconception they have is that the existing revocable living trust mm-hmm. that they already put in place is protecting their assets. That's the biggest okay. misconception because they, they were told this is going to protect you. Well, yeah. what that meant is it's going to protect you in the event that you die. It's going to make sure that you maximize your estate tax exemptions and that your assets are going to pass properly to your beneficiaries. That's what that attorney meant when he said, you're good to go. You're protected now. He did not mean it's protected from creditors. So I get a lot of people that call and they go, oh yeah, I have a trust. I'm all set. And what they have is a revocable living trust. Well, they're all set to die, but they're not all set for a lawsuit. So if a lawsuit comes, they're in real trouble. If they die, they're good to go. <laughs> all set to die. Let, let that be a key takeaway. If yeah. that doesn't get your attention. Okay, I love that. Uh, what, what is, uh, so you mentioned that's one uh, point of enlightenment for folks who, who come to you. Uh, what is the biggest mistake that you see? Is it the same? That is, is there something where you're looking at like, gosh, geez, like where are you getting your advice? Is there something that, that sticks out at you that that's uh, a freaking occurrence? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the biggest mistake I see is, is um, people building all their assets in their personal name. That's the biggest mistake because it's the easiest. The banks like it the best. Every, everybody, you know, even your accountant, if they're lazy, they don't want to do more tax returns, which I never understood because accountants are always resistant to more work and yet they bill by the hour. So I'm not quite sure they're so resistant to it. It's, but it's amazing to me that oftentimes they, they don't want more entities per client. Um, so what I see is I see a lot of people, they just build all the assets in their own personal name. I had one guy in California He'd been doing real estate for 40 years. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say he had $100 million of real estate all in his personal name. The cost to change that was so great at that point because it had been so long and there was so much we were going to have to do um, that he ultimately decided to leave it that way because it was going to cost him more than a a lawsuit would likely cost him to settle. No. Okay. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> right. Because he just, he built it all and that's the way he did it. And, and what I've learned is that once you get into a routine of how things get done, you do it the same. So yeah. you probably brush your teeth the same way every day. You probably so, just, you, you're in a, you're in a pattern. Power of habits. Building your business and your portfolio, get your pattern set right. And you're going to look up in 10 years and it's going to be right. You're not going to yeah. look up in 10 years and go, oh my God, I got this huge mess on my hands and now I got to undo it all and figure it out. And it, it 
always costs a lot more to correct a bunch of uh, messed up stuff than it does to get it right in the first place. Douglas, I'm glad you brought that home because, I mean, that's the point, right? I mean, that's why, why I do this. I'm learning so much right now, and I'm trying to share with the rest of my community, and I think everybody wins that way. And it's about experimenting other people's successful experiments, right? If people have done sure. one thing successfully, uh, why try to uh, reinvent the wheel? So so thank you for that. Um, okay, so th- that's very interesting. What, what do you think is um, personally you? I, I mean, I'm very curious that you're, you're, you've gotten to the point where you, you've gotten to this far, you're always giving people advice. And, and what do you think is an advi- the best advice you ever received uh, for even, it could be your personal career or even advice that you're today or passing down to some of your clients? What do you think that, is there anything that sticks out at you? Yeah. Um, uh, act, do it, start. Um, you know, I see a lot of people that are, are always getting ready to start. And then you see people that start when they're not ready and they make a bunch of mistakes, but they figure it out. And those same two people, if you look 10 years down the road, the one is still getting ready to start 10 years later. The other one has started and failed and started and failed and, and corrected and corrected. And all of a sudden, they got something figured out and it's working for them. Don't be afraid. Just yeah. do it. Whatever you think you can do or dream you can do, do it. Because it's got, it. there's magic in that, in that just beginning something and not being afraid. So um, I remember when I was still a kid, I was, I was a teenager. One of my dad's friends said, first thing you should do is go out and buy a duplex. This was way back before real estate was, was what it is today where podcasts and everybody's talking about syndication. And I'm like, I haven't even thought about any of that, but that was his first piece of advice. Go figure it out, buy a duplex, live in half, rent the other, and just start building. Um, and it, it changed the way I saw it. I'm like, wow, I guess I'm not, too young to start thinking that way, yeah. even though I was 17 years old. Um, and so I think it's just very important that you do it. Don't, don't plan forever. Don't get into the analysis paralysis of just trying to always figure it out. It's not going to be perfect. It's just not. Just do it and, and, and learn and try, try to do it as well as you can, but don't be afraid that you're going to make a mistake because you will. Absolutely. And it'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. No, I'm I'm a huge believer to start when you're not ready, um, yeah. uh, and then along the way, uh, throughout your experience, get the knowledge. You know, get yeah. folks like you figure can, it out. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, they're very fascinating. So, uh, want to transition to insider secrets for? So you talked about um, your um, licensing, and and the reason I, I want to get into that real quick is uh, insider secrets. A lot of business oriented folks, uh, real estate investors, entrepreneurs. Uh, how did that process go about? Because we're, we're big on brand building. We're built, big on building businesses, real estate, et cetera. So uh, at what point did you say, hey, you know, I have this proof of concept and I want to license it. And maybe just enlighten us for some of us who might be thinking or who may never have thought of licensing something. How does that process look like? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I, I do a lot of coaching, um, meaning I get a lot of coaching. So I go to, you know, I pay for and go to coaching. Um, I think that's incredibly valuable. There's a lot of free coaching like this online where you can get insight, but it's also powerful to go to a coach that you're paying to help you build your business, your personal, there's, you know, all sides, sorts of coaches. Uh, One of those coaches said, make your competitors your uh, biggest asset. And I thought, okay, who are my competitors? My competitors are other attorneys out there. And um, I said, well, most other attorneys, and when I mean most, I mean 99.9% of other attorneys do not do what I do or even know how to do what I do. So not only are they not really competitors of mine, but they're potential sources of new clients if I could educate the attorney on, on what I do and help them build their business. The other piece of advice I've heard many, many times was if you want to be successful, help someone else be successful. Um, I think that one is, is you know, probably at this point, everybody knows that one and, and it's true. If you want to be successful, help other people be successful. So what I realized is I do have a great, um, a great model of a great trust. It's a great system. It works incredibly well. Um, and so I started to educate other attorneys on it and, and actually encouraging them 
to work with me to co-counsel cases. And wow. that's how the whole concept of licensing, um, that's when I branded the Bridge Trust and really focused on creating a brand around it. Um, if you don't have a brand, then you, you know, what are you, what are you going to license? You know, you got to have something. So creating the brand is really important. Um, uh, you know, I could go on, I could go on a lot about a lot of this stuff for a oh, long time. Oh, I love it. No, um, I know. I love yeah. this topic. Uh, but no, thank, thank you for sharing that. I, I, sure. I think that's very valuable. And, uh, um, I'm curious. I think the next question I want to ask is, uh, I guess, who's the most, uh, you talked about coaches and maybe do you have a, a some coach you want to, or mentor or someone that you follow that would be, has been, has a huge impact on you? Um, yeah, there's been quite a few, but I yeah. probably the one that's most relevant to mention in this, in this podcast is um, uh, Dan Sullivan of Strategic Coach. Yeah. So um, Strategic Coach is a big organization. Dan is the creator. Um, he was my personal coach, but um, he, there's a lot of coaches in that organization. They're all really incredible. Um, if you're, if you're in business, if you're building your business, um, I would definitely reach out, look them up and, and see if, uh, because he, his is so straight up. I mean, some really, really practical things. He's a brilliant thinker and he's just, he's just kind of dialed it down to the most important essential things. Um, even just like, you know, the concept of, Oh, dividing your week up into free days, focus days, and buffer days. Oh, that's right. And, you know, yeah. just, just, that's his concept. I use it to this day. You know, yeah. I have days that are free. I don't do any work on them. I have buffer days where I answer emails and I do certain things. Then I have focus days where it's just all about, you know, I'm just wall to wall working on with, with, you know, my, my, my calendar is booked. Um, it's yeah. a very efficient thing to do. And he teaches that and lots of other great concepts. Was it, I'm curious, Douglas, were you always um, so, and, and again, it's so fascinating, the amount of people that have come on the show, again, we're, we're talking like, it's just, it's a billion, billion dollars worth of just, just personal development in itself, and is that something you're always big on, or is that something as, as, as you came along the way, you started, hey, I need to fine tune my, my axe here, I need to sharpen my axe here and there, like, is this, tell me, is it, well, which one was it? I mean, I've always valued coaching. I mean, I grew up playing sports and, and yes. without coaches. You what know, sport? You, you, I play basketball. Nice, me too. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and when you got, I think my biggest realization as a young person was that I'm not done learning. You know, there was, a, there was an initial thing. You're out of school. You're like, okay, I'm done. But yeah. then I realized, wow, I'm not even near done. I'm not even close to done. I'm just starting. Yeah. And um, once, I, once I realized that I'm not done learning, I started looking again for people to teach. Um, and, and both personally, I think there's a complete inter interconnection between your professional life and your personal life. You know, you can't really be rocking and rolling professionally and falling apart personally and mm -hmm. consider yourself truly successful. It's, it's, it's got to get all of it. And um, so, you know, not one coach is going to be able to do everything for you. So I, I've done lots of different stuff to try to fill the gaps in and then create my own, you know, my own, my own uh, system that works for me. That's awesome. And uh, insider secret last one is uh, considering that you help so many real estate investors and, and just individuals all across the board, really. Uh, do you also, are you a believer in real estate and what kind of uh, real estate you, you find yourself getting into? I know you mentioned a duplex and I didn't want to let that one slip through the cracks. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I am a believer that if you're going to do anything, do it well. Yeah. Um, People can do – when, when you're in a rising market, when yeah. everything is going great and the economy is booming, it's kind of hard to mess it up because a lot of your mistakes get just um, covered up by, by the growth and the, and, and the economy and, and the money that's coming in. Yeah. It's when things contract that the mistakes start to come out. Mm. So I was around for the 2008 crisis. I had lots of clients. Um, including a lot of real estate clients. And, and you saw the ones that were over leveraged um, all fell apart. Um, the ones that were not um, didn't, and they were able to withstand. So it's very important um, uh, that whatever you do, whether it's the real estate, whether you trade futures, whether you're a stock investor, whether you, um, you know, are putting together deals, whatever it is, be thorough and be diligent and get it right and plan for if nothing, if everything doesn't go perfect. And what I'm concerned with right at this moment is not real estate as a class, 
But the fact that it has become such a popular thing and everybody's doing it, and I know from, from previous experience when everybody's doing it, a lot of them are doing it wrong. And a lot of them are doing it half-baked and just put, throwing things together. And um, you know, right now we're in a contraction. We've had a 30% pullback. Absolutely. You drive down the street, everything's closed. Yeah. Um, I've got, I just spoke to a client. He owns commercial properties. He's gotten notices from major tenants. I mean, we're talking big, giant national tenants that they are looking for abatements and rent and they're retaining their rights in the, in the leases. Real estate is not foolproof. Nothing Absolutely. is. So if you think, oh, it's always going to be up and great, you know, we can't lose with this. Um, you, you can lose. You can always lose. So doing it right is very important. Um, so yeah, I'm a believer in real estate um, and I have real estate, but uh, that's not my business, not my main business. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm a lawyer and so I focus on what I do best. Uh, if I really wanted to get into real estate, I would, I would invest with somebody who does nothing but that. That's what yeah. I would do because I believe in experts. I believe people have taken the time to get really good at something. Um, let them do it. You yeah, know, absolutely. I don't have to get good at everything and do it myself. Good for you. Good response. That's, that's a good one. I think more people need to hear that. Uh, let's go into the core rapid fire questions right before we head out there. Um, okay. I'm going to blast these right at you. All right. All right. Uh, favorite book. Uh, a Course in Miracles. Okay. I haven't heard that one. Um, best personal, habit. That's, personal development. That's personal what that development? is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, best habit that serves you every day? Uh, meditation. Hmm. I like that. Uh, best tool that helps you excel throughout the day? Um, the best tool that I have is, is um, uh, probably just the, my time management and focusing on yeah. um, keeping, keeping the days clean. Um, I, I learned at one point I can be 10 times as efficient as I used to be. Um, and you just don't know what that does to your life if you're 10x your former self. So figure out how you can be 10x. You can, believe me. Yeah. Remove all the crap. Fair if it's not serving you, if you're using systems, if you're doing stuff that is just, you never ask yourself why, ask yourself why you're doing it and if you should be doing it. Um, make everything as efficient as possible. I like that. I like that. Um, cash flow versus equity. Um, cash flow is king. Equity is equity. So, so there's a saying, um, gross is vanity, net is sanity, cash flow is king. So <laughs> I, like I think you should live by that. Gross is vanity. Oh, I have a business. I, it's, you know, I gross $100 million. Mm -hmm. Net is sanity. I uh, actually only net $2 million. Cash is king. Actually, I have negative cash flow because I had a bunch of debt service. So, cash. Love it. Love that. If you had one superpower in um, in, in in your current field, uh, what would it be? Uh, a superpower would be to communicate, to be able to just instantly go, boom, here's what I know. And then you go, oh, got it. I want to work with you. Damn, I think you got a superpower, Douglas, because I think you did a fantastic <laughs> job today. Yeah, uh, last question. What question do you wish I would have asked you? Um, uh, boy, I don't know. Uh, I think you asked all the good ones. Um, you know? Yeah. I always, I, I always I give that one as an opportunity. If there's something that I don't know that I should know that you want to put out there. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's no, you, you did a great job. I think you, I think you got all the points and we, we probably overloaded everybody with information. So, oh, hey. You can never kill well, to have too much information, well, depending on how you consume it. You I can guess, have but, too much information. But, you you can't yeah. have too much knowledge, and, and there's a huge difference between them. Mm. And, uh, if you can distill the information into usable knowledge, you're, yes. you're providing great value. If you're just regurgitating in, in, information, that's what the internet is, right? It's yeah. just this massive, massive, you know, yeah, just just you know, information being thrown at us. Um, we need, we need to be able to, um, digest it and, and work, find out what's relevant information for us. You yeah. know? And that's what experts do for us. We, yeah. we I, I go to my CPA. I mean, I'm a tax attorney. I, I, I have, I have as much or more education than the CPAs in, in the tax code. Mm -hmm. I don't do it. I go to my CPA. He's yeah. doing it every day. He's much better than I am at, yeah. or ever could be at that. Even though I have information in my head. 
Yeah, I think I think that's that's you couldn't have said that. I think that's so important because there's so many gurus out there and so much information like never before. And yeah. I think you know we do we try to do a good job of vetting who comes into the lab. And for that reason, I can't thank you for joining us today. Uh, where can listeners find out more about you, Douglas, and what your uh, fantastic company is doing for the people? Yeah, you can go to my website. That's got a ton of information, videos, I mean, massive amounts of articles. You can probably search around in there and find out most every answer you want. Uh, that's just my name, lodmel.com, L-O-D-M-E-L-L.com. Uh, you can email me, which is also my name, Doug at lodmel.com. Just say, hey, I heard you on the show and I had yeah. this question. Um, or you can call my office uh, at 800-231-7112 and um, ask to speak to me and we'll set up an appointment. That's awesome. Thank you so much for Douglas, uh, Douglas for being here and uh, dropping all the gems and knowledge. And just like that, we are out. <laughs>